Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Well, it's my pleasure to be here today. I appreciate the sponsors allowing me to talk about what I think is a pretty important topic, and that's mass timber in parentheses CLT research needs and challenges. Uh, and we've heard a lot of that already uh, today from the other speakers. I think a better title for this, but uh, probably not one I would want to put in the, uh, the handout, what do we know and what do we need to learn to make CLT a mainstream structural framing system? Now, in order to answer those questions, we held a research workshop on mass timber, again, focusing on CLT at the Forest Products Lab in Madison back on November 3rd and 4th. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, facilitating that uh, workshop, and it was a really big success as far as everybody that attended. It was sponsored by the Forest Products Lab, Woodworks, and the Softwood Lumber Board, two of the sponsors of this uh, conference. We had over 120 researchers, practitioners, and government employees involved. We had 26 invited speakers covering all aspects of mass timber research. We had a full day of brainstorming on future mass timber research needs, and the proceedings are published as an FPL general technical report, and I'll give you a, a link to that on my very last slide. Uh, we just got done uh, completing that uh, last week. What we did at the workshop is we talked, we broke everything into four topic areas. Resistance to lateral loads, building performance, which included durability, vibration, acoustics, creep, and life cycle assessment, fire safety, and we've heard a lot about fire safety in the previous session, and the material resources and other topics. And again, we had 26 individual presentations the first day, the second day we went into the brainstorming session. What I'm going to do in my little presentation today is, is to take each of the areas, tell you what the topics were, and just highlight a couple of them from each one, certainly not all of them. One of the main ones is the seismic performance factors to CLT, and that's being done at CSU. Uh, the Canadians have done a lot of work of mass timber structures under lateral loads. In fact, I'm going to say right now, if it hadn't been for the Canadians and the work they've done in Canada, we wouldn't be having this, work, this conference today. They took the lead. The Canadian government put five, six million dollars out to do research, to, to find out some preliminary answers, and uh, I can just say that, that without that we wouldn't be here today. We had a really interesting presentation uh, from the Colorado School of Mines, I'm going to highlight that one. We learned about the heavy timber buckling restrained brace system, and my colleague up here at the podium, Hans Eric, is going to talk about that after I'm done. And then we hit CLT diaphragm research with Scott Brenneman. Again, going back to Canada, they jumped in on this lateral load resisting system research. They did cyclic tests on connections with different brackets, different fasteners, different various configurations of walls. They included the effects of vertical load, different brackets in their position, different fasteners, use of hold downs or not, CLT walls with half lap joints, two story assemblies, tall walls, they call that 16 feet, and the influence of walls on CLT floor panels. And these are just some of the configurations they test. And again, this was a major, major effort to get us started down the path. And you can see, like the number two up there has got the hold down, similar to the first one, it doesn't have hold down. And some of the different brackets they tested and the different fasteners that they used. Summarizing it all, and this was years of testing uh, with different brackets and fasteners. Whoops, going the wrong way here. Uh, one thing about CLT is they behave almost as rigid bodies. They're not like our conventional stick frame construction. It's pretty ductile. These are not very ductile. And uh, they had some uh, slight shear deformation of the panel, but most of the deflections occurred as a result of the deformation in the joints connecting the walls. And this is what we would expect. In the case of multi-panel walls, they had deformations of the step joints, which significant contribution to the overall. What they've come up with in Canada are recommendations for seismic force resistance factors, an RD for ductility of 2 and an RO for overstrength of 1.5. And those are pretty darn conservative, I'll say that right now. Moving to the United States, the work that's being done in this area is being done at Colorado State University with John Vandalin. They're doing this research uh, to comply with FEMA P695 provisions for establishing seismic design coefficients for new technologies and the goal is to have this completed and seismic design coefficient submitted to the Building Seismic Safety Council. I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later by mid this year. The FEMA P695 is a methodology that's been introduced into the United States that says if you've got a new seismic force resisting system, this is what you've got to do to get it into the building code. It's consistent with primary life safety performance objective of our building code. 
It involves peer review, uh, archetypes, which is the different types of buildings that you're going to test, developing a design methodology, uh, assessing a nonlinear time history analysis, and an overall performance evaluation. Lots and lots of tests. Uh, this is just some of the tests, isolated wall tests, box type configurations, box type configurations with multiple panel walls, et cetera. This project's about $750,000. So this is not something we do uh, without a lot of input. Uh, it's pretty much done. This is some of the testing, uh, one of the fasteners on the right there. And we got what we expected, nail pull out, and the bolt uh, pulling away from the support member. That was just a simple wall. Where are we? Well, their next steps, they still do have to do some wall assembly tests with diaphragms using low aspect ratio panels, high aspect ratio panels, three-sided with an opening on one side, so forth, as you see there. Then they're going to finalize their analysis. I haven't talked to John Vanillet uh, in the last month or two, but I think they're pretty close to doing that. Then they'll submit it to that peer review panel. And that peer review panel will review everything they've done. If they buy into it, they'll then submit it to the Building Seismic Safety Council, which is part of FEMA. And then we'll talk about where we go next later on. Diaphragms, we had a great presentation uh, by Scott on this. Analytically, we can calculate how, how a diaphragm is going to perform. Uh, this is a white paper that was generated by the American Wood Council with input from a number of other people, uh, Max Closen from uh, Mighty Con, uh, Chris Bickler from uh, Structure Lamb, Bill Line from the American Wood Council, et cetera. Problem is, we need some full-scale strength testing and verification for this. It's great to be able to sit down with a finite element model and say, this is how we think it works. We've never tested one. Seismic performance uh, can be broken down into three levels as far as I'm concerned. Code minimum, tier one, and this is you know, looking at different types of earthquakes, near fault ground motions, and what happens. Well, certainly we want to be able to, to have a life safety situation, but then we're looking at you know, how much time would it take to repair this? What kind of damage would you have? And it's pretty significant. Next level would be a code plus, and this is the, really what we're talking the alternate method, what the people like, uh, Benton are doing with theirs, uh, where they're taking it to another level, and we're still looking at fairly severe damage, but it's protecting life safety. And the one that I'm leading up to is a resilient system. Now, this is kind of like, to me, the Cadillac or the upper limit on this type of thing. I, I was pretty, I'm pretty impressed by where they're going. This has started, this is a technology that's really coming out of New Zealand. And you can see, just for example, on a service level earthquake, instead of taking one to seven days to repair it, you're talking 30 minutes. So we're getting a lot more ductility in the system. Earlier I mentioned this is not a real ductile product. Um, they're looking at different uh, options. This is a multi-university project, Colorado School of Mines, Washington State, University of Washington, et cetera. And they looked at a couple of different ways of doing this. And what they want to do is add ductility and dissipate energy, which is what we do with a typical conventionally framed wall, and remain damage free or li damage limited at large deformations. And this is their, what we call, they call a rocking wall. Um, and it uses uh, post-tensioning post uh, rods down through the wall. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. It's a very intricate test. They've done a number of these tests now with different configurations, different pre-stressing or post-tensioning levels, et cetera. And what they've learned is that the proposed seismic design procedure for tall timber buildings result in CLT walls with adequate performance, better than, uh, adequate to what they expected. The rocking CLT panels have good ductility. They looked at a hierarchy of desirable limit states and identified that. They did find that variability in CLT materials is a concern. They came up with a numerical model, a simple nonlinear model that represented test data. And the implementation of the model for tall buildings showed the design procedure can meet design objectives. However, we need a lot more research on this. As I understand their study, they're looking at another two to three years before we'd have something done that would be ready for code acceptance. Building performance was another topic area. We had um, Canadians talk about acoustics, vibration, and creep. We had the Forest Products Lab talk about hydrothermal performance. Uh, had a colleague from Sweden come in and talk about acoustics again. And then Jim Boyer from Dovetail talked about the need for a competitive, comparative life cycle assessment. Now, LCL, LCA is a buzzword, but we use it all the time. How do we compare this mass timber or cross dynamic timber building to an equivalent steel building or equivalent concrete building from a life cycle, expectant, life cycle assessment. Again, going back to the work done by FP Innovations in Canada on three areas, acoustics, vibration, and creep. 
they're one of the few organizations that have taken this on. Uh, they've done a great job. Acoustics, you know, if you're de developing these tall buildings with multifamily uh, applications, condos, acoustics is huge. Uh, we've got to have some way of controlling sound. Of course, the code says that uh, we have a sound transmission class, an STC. We can measure that through laboratory measurements. Uh, in, in the IBC, it says we have to have an STC of 50 or more. And that's where loud speech would be barely, faintly audible, loud music barely audible, et cetera. In other words, you are not going to destroy your neighbors in your condo. If you look from the CLT handbook, and we haven't talked much about the handbooks, there's two handbooks for Canada and the U.S. They're each about 500 pages. If you just have a three-layer CLT panel, you're talking about an STC class of 32 to 34. Not good enough. If you add five eight inch gypsum board, you only get up to mid thirties. Takes two layer or two three two three layer CLT panels with a sound installation material in between to get to that fifty. Now the handbooks have a whole bunch of these, but we're just scratching the surface on sound. Vibration is a huge issue, especially in floor systems when you're talking about walking across your floor in your apartment and what's happening out in the hallway if it's continuous. National Building Code of Canada does address this. They have requirements uh, for a joisted floor without topping and for steel joists with a concrete slab. They have nothing on joisted floors with concrete and nothing on CLT. And this isn't even addressed in the U.S. codes, to the best of my knowledge. The Canadians have come up with a, a model for predicting vibration performance. Uh, is FP Innovations and the University of New Brunswick. This is their model. It's an equation, a pretty simple one. And it pretty much predicts how a floor is going to work from a vibration perspective when people walk on it. Question is, does it apply to CLT floor systems? They've done some subjective tests at Forest Products Innovation, and it, it tends to support this. And the comparisons with the European design methods are pretty positive, but we're not there yet. Creep. Early European studies said that the long-term behavior of CLT is comparable to that of plywood. And comparing it to glue lamb, which is a, you know, a very similar mass timber product, it's about 30 to 40 percent higher. They did the exploratory study on this at FP Innovations, and they come up with some information using the ASTMD 6815 standard, which, which says they can meet the standard requirements uh, by doing this testing. And this is an equation right out of the NDS for an engineer to predict the total deflection of a member, and we have a creep factor built in there. What they're recommending is 2.0 for CLT that compares to 1.5 for glue lamb, which is in that 30% difference range. Fire safety. We've been hearing a lot about fire safety. Dave Barber in our previous session talked about exposed mass timber. Canadians uh, talked about their research on, on fire. Forest Products Lab has done an interesting study on uh, cross laminated timber. And we've got some uh, inputs from the American Wood Council on the property protection view. So a lot of different topics there. We've seen similar type slides. This is my favorite slide. I'm a glue lamb guy from 45 years ago. I've been using these types of slides forever. I've probably run 100 different glue lamb fire tests. Wood's a great heat insulator. Develops that char layer. Goes out after the fire source is removed. And still retains good strength. And that works for both glue lamb and cross laminated timber. Our colleagues in Canada jumped in again right up front, did a lot of full-scale testing according to their standard, which is very, it's a, a different name, but it's the same as our ASTM E119 test. They developed charring rates, fire performance of the adhesive, in this case the polyurethane, which is, was being used by their supplier, their CLT supplier. Came up with a calculation procedure for U.S. and can, Canadian standards and did some additional tests. Now, this all led, well, let me, oh, I got ahead of myself. Let's look at what they tested. They tested three, five, and seven ply, fully loaded, uh, using again polyurethane, ASTM E119, and different uh, types of gypsum board. For walls, a five ply, unprotected, will give us about 57 minutes, close to the hour. Seven ply is certainly almost two hours. And you add some gypsum, and you're going to get there easily. For floors, uh, five ply unprotected gives us 96 minutes. Uh, seven plies, we're almost three hours. Benton was talking about his his uh, system that's going to get three and a half hours. So we, we know that CLT performs really pretty well. It exhibits a significant fire resistance, very similar to glue lamb, some difference uh, in that you have a step charring model. It's not constant. Failure modes are different from walls to floors. Uh, but, but in the bottom, at the end of the day, we do know a fair amount about how to test the CLT and how it's going to perform. This all led to being incorporated into the 
2015 edition of the National Design Spec. Chapter 16, been there for many years. It was there primarily for heavy timber glue lamps. Allows the designer to calculate a one, one and a half, or two hour fire rating. And CLT was added based on mostly this Canadian research and some other research. We added a new table for CLT char rates. We've got equations for calculating char depth. And we can come up with design values. So an engineer can walk through this and say this system's going to get one hour or whatever. There's been some compartment fires. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. Uh, Amanda was talking about this. And it's something they're going to be doing. Our colleagues up in Canada at NRC have a great facility. They did a three-story apartment unit with no sprinklers, put furnishings in there, set it on fire, and they got 185 minutes out of it with no structural failure. Now, this was with gypsum. There was no fire spread beyond the compartment boundaries, and it was very similar if you ran a non-combustible test with steel. CL, uh, American Wood Council did a compartment fire test last year, a 16 by 12 room, two layers of type X gyp, and again, same type of thing with furnishings, different times through the thing, and, and I believe Dennis showed this one in his presentation. When you got done and cleared the debris out, the wood really wasn't damaged. Uh, their conclusions are that CLT protected by two layers of type X is going to perform similar to any steel frame structure. How about if one wall is unprotected? It turns out you get almost the same performance as the two layers fully protected. Two walls, now we're looking at what we're calling delamination, failure of the, the outer layer at about 40 to 80 minutes. If you go within all, all walls, we really don't know much of how that's going to perform. And we need, as Dave Barber said, we need to look at that. Material resources and other topics, this was our closeout session. Uh, the Forest Products Lab, Rusty, who's, who's on the steering committee here, talked about the C CLT supply chain. Benton talked about his timber concrete composites. You just heard about that. Ben, earlier today, talked about what they're doing in Utah with non-glued uh, mass timber, nail laminated type thing. Had a presentation on blast testing. Pretty interesting. I'm going to hit that one in just a second. And a mass timber tornado safe room. We closed up with an overview of the first CLT hotel down at the Redstone Arsenal. And you're going to hear about that here at the conference uh, in a couple of presentations by Lend Lease. Mass timber tornado safe room. You know, we want to be able to provide for people in the, t in the tornado zones with a, a room in their house that they can go to and be safe. Um, the idea is to design a residential tornado safe room using wood framing systems, primarily CLT at this point in time. It'd be a, it, something you could do with your existing house, build it by a do-it-yourselfer, go down to Lowe's, Home Depot, and get the parts, have it low cost, and size to serve other functions. If you want to build a big safe room, you could have a living room that would be your safe room, not just an 8 by 8 room, and to work on optimizing material usage. Uh, they've got to do testing on this, the wall and door testing, to meet an EF5 tornado, which is a really nasty tornado, debris impact testing, wind pressure testing, full-size room, wind load test, develop standard plans and guidelines, and develop a dynamic impact model. To me, this is a huge market opportunity for CLT that we never even thought about, most of us. We're all talking buildings. Well, here, I'm going to take care of that family in, 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 uh, in the Midwest there, and we're in their t tornado area. Blast resistance, another one I hadn't really thought a lot about. Expand market opportunities in the Department of Defense and growing civilian markets requiring blast resistance structures. They're working with the Army Corps engineers on this with the Protective Design Center to come up with an acceptable mass timber alternative to steel and masonry. And it'll be included in their guidelines. Uh, the idea is to demonstrate the resistance across laminated timber via live blast field full-scale testing. They're going to do some test configurations ahead of time, one, two story, 30 by 15, two bays, other options. A lot of work to be done here, but again, an opportunity that we really probably, most of us, hadn't thought about. Blast resistance structure for the Department of Defense. I don't know what the market opportunity is there, but I think it could be pretty large. And then you're going to do this at the end. You're going to blow something up and see how it works. That's kind of fun. Okay, let me get back to what happened. That's just a taste of what the people at the workshop heard. We're going to look at the four areas as to what are our needs. What we did is we broke our 120 people up into two groups, about 60 apiece, obviously about 60 apiece. Put them in a room with the presenters and said, talk about what you heard and what you need, think needs to be done. And everybody had an hour on each of these topics, so it was, it was a, a lot of input. Hundreds of ideas came out of this, literally hundreds of ideas. Uh, it, was, it was pretty phenomenal. And then we put everybody back together in a room at the end of the day and said, okay, now we've heard all this. Let's see if we can come up with some prioritizations. What are the real key issues? Well, if we look at shear walls, that 
development of, of the seismic design, R factors, and design guidelines, probably our number one, high, number one priority in seismic areas. The completion of the current testing at Colorado State is a first step, and we have to understand that whatever comes out of that will be limited based on the scope of what was able to be modeled and validated, and those limits are going to become our future barriers. That project, <coughs> I mentioned the peer review, probably getting underway right now. Dan Dolan is here, and he's on the peer review committee. I should have asked him where they are on that. Then goes to the FEMA Building Seismic Safety Council. Dan's also on that. Eventually to ASCE 7, and into the IBC. Now, we could be talking three to six years here before we see this in the IBC. It's not a short process. I mean, even if we got the data right now, it's not going to make the 2018 code. I'm pretty sure of that. ASC 7 used to chair that group, uh, or I was involved with that group, and it's a tough audience to get things through and get added. Diaphragms, again, we need to test connections and full-scale diaphragms to quantify what we think we know from our finite element modeling, uh, whether the lateral force system is a wall or a heavy timber brace frame like Hans is going to talk about. The diaphragm comes into play and is an important design consideration. Real concern exists that details of panelized CLT diaphragms may produce brittle failure, brittle behavior, and loss of structural function in seismic overload situations. Again, an area that we don't know much about. Design and modeling guidelines are needed. So we can give designers, here's how you do it, and here's the basis for it. Let's have some standardized test methodology. Connections, we're doing testing on connections. Uh, we did it, uh, we being the industry at, at uh, FP Innovations at Colorado State. If a manufacturer wanted to sit down and go through a FEMA P695 research study, you're talking again, three quarters of a million dollars maybe. Most manufacturers are not gonna buy into that. And hopefully what we learn from the testing at CSU is gonna be able to give us a basis for, for moving forward without doing all that testing. Another thing, when you get into these tall buildings, you get some pretty high loads at the hold downs at the base for overturning and shear forces. We don't have connections that can, can even handle that right now. So we need work on that area. Resistance to lateral loads, brace frames, again, we're going to hear about that from our next speaker, so I'm not even going to go into that. Uh, he'll tell us all about it and what we need to know. But the idea from this was we really want to look at this strongly because it could move us forward into a, an area we've never done before. It's not in the code. Go to building performance acoustics. Again, a lot of multifamily apartments. Acoustics is a big concern. We need more research on how to best achieve good acoustic performance. And from our Swedish friends, we found out that sometimes the sound frequencies we're looking at really aren't even the important ones. So we have to look at a wide range of frequencies and construction systems. How do we handle flanking sound? All the different ways that sound can move through a wall or a floor. Life cycle assessment, it was really strong support that we need an LCA study comparing a CLT frame building with competitive materials, obviously steel and concrete, to demonstrate the environmental benefits. We all know they're there, but when you talk to an engineer, an architect, or an owner and say it's there, they want proof, and we don't have it. And we have to be very careful on selecting a project. It's got to have reproduci reproducibility of data. The partners have to be willing to share it, to publish it. Uh, they looked at a number of projects, and they haven't quite picked one yet that they're going to do. Uh, that's a dovetail. Vibration. Again, that's a key design variable in these buildings on the mass timber floors. Uh, many variables affect it, uh, spans, boundary conditions, floor weight, and a lot of others. And we really need to do more to assess that. We've got that model that I talked about from Canada. That's for just a simple floor. It really doesn't go much further than that. And another vibration issue that came up in the workshop is, uh, again, we're going to build these tall buildings, the 18-story building at uh, UBC. Uh, how does the wind affect that? What kind of vibrations do the winds induce in these tall wood buildings? Uh, maybe Benton's got all the answers on his. I'm not sure. But it's something that we don't know much about, and we really need to take a, a strong look at that because people are going to ask us that question. Again, on building performance, the moisture issues, We've not really done much work on moisture issues. Uh, leaking, the building envelope uh, fails and you get moisture into it. Bulk water, uh, Forest Products Lab is, is, is gonna move into this direction pretty quickly, come up with some information on how we can address moisture issues. And again, that creep issue, big deal. We know a lot about creep of other products, lumber, blue lamb, LVL. We really don't know much about CLT and we really need to come up with a better design a better understanding of how this works. Fire safety, 
We heard this one a couple of times, connection performance. Fire resistance of connections are really important. They can either be concealed or exposed. And on the right side there, you'll see one of each. We don't have any way of testing those. There's no standard fire test for a connection or a glue lamp for one hour or two hours. And we have no tested assemblies that I'm aware of right now. We can have ways of suggesting how to get one hour ratings by just hiding, the wood, hiding it in wood, putting a jip around it, whatever. But we don't have any test data. And that's going to limit us, I think, in many, many cases, not having that answer. Adhesives, we heard somebody ask a question earlier about this. Adhesive is a big concern. We call it delamination. That's a, again, somebody mentioned how do you even define delamination. In the glue lamp industry, delamination is when the glue fails due to exposure to moisture and just disintegrates. So in this case, I guess, is when it burns away. And it does happen in the fire exposure, and you get multiple flashovers. Uh, Dave Barber talked a little bit about that. The FPL has done some interesting research uh, on different adhesives. And all adhesives are not equal, I'll tell you right now. One of the best ones is our good old standby of a resource owner. We've been using that in the glue lamp industry forever, and it has the best performance. And they looked at different CLTs, but a lot more testing is needed on adhesives from a fire standpoint. Maybe the biggest one, and it's not, I don't know if you call it research, how do we tell the fire service, the code officials, and the insurance industry what we know? Somebody said, you know, we, we know it's going to burn, but it really shouldn't restrict us in market growth. Do we do seminars, webinars, brochures, one-on-one -on -one sessions? That's a, that's a big one, that we've got to come up with a plan from the industry. And heard this one earlier from Dennis. We need to convince the International Code Council to increase heights and area limitations for heavy timber type 4 construction. They are farming the ICC Ad Hoc Committee on Tall Wood Buildings. I think it's been formed or it'll be announced uh, either this week or next week. So that's a huge step forward. Fire performance with different degrees of exposed mass timber. Go back to what Dave Barber talked about. If we encapsulate everything in gypsum, okay, we know it works really well. What if we expose one wall? Doesn't hurt us too bad. What if we expose adjacent walls? Not too sure. How about opposite walls? All kinds of different ways of exposing things. And we know, and you can't really see it in that slide, at the top is a fully unprotected room. Massive heat release. At the very bottom is a fully protected room. Not much. And that test one, or test two, excuse me, is, is one wall exposed. So a lot of work needs to be done there. And we need to document, prove, whatever you want to use the word, that it really performs better than other competitive systems. Maybe we need to do full-scale fire demonstration projects, but those are really expensive. On the material resources, just a few comments here. We, the, the group in Madison felt that continuing the research on blast resistance and tornado resistance uh, type construction really could open up new markets. We need to continue that. We need a better understanding of sourcing for the mass timber products. And I'm sure the other people in the other room have been talking about that a lot. We've got a gap between what's available and what we need to use, such as beetle kill, forest fire thinning, what's accessible, what's economical. And we need strategies for bringing that wood resource to the market and to further develop that supply chain. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. Uh, it'll be in the, the, uh, on the slides here. But we need more information on costing. Is it cost competitive? And if not, what can we do to help it? Develop a series of case studies, complete economic impact studies, undertake general market research. Uh, I'm not sure how that really fits into research, but it is research. It's just not the kind of thing I'm normally associated with. In optimizing the manufacturing to reduce costs. Uh, use of wider range of species and grades and adhesives and so forth. Two interesting things came out of the, the workshop that we really had not expected. Number one is there is a tremendous amount of information available worldwide on mass timber research. But you try and find it. I mean, you can spend a lot of time on your computer trying to find it. So what they said is let's get together and let's develop an easy to access industry database worldwide. And the FPL has already started that. The second concern, I heard somebody else express this in, in maybe a different way, is how does the wood products industry train our future leaders at both the university and the practicing professional level? Woodworks is doing a great job with the practicing professionals, but there's not much being done at the university level. Very few universities teach wood. Certainly most of them don't even know about cross-laminated timber or mass timber. So that's a huge barrier down the road. That, that's not something we solve overnight. So the proceedings have been published. Their general technical report 
FPL GTR 241. They're on the FPL website you see there. Uh, Bob Ross and I edited those. And we just finished them up last, uh, two weeks ago. And I think that they're down in the uh, Forest uh, Products Lab booth downstairs. You can print the whole thing. You can download it. It's got all these different presentations, all these summaries. It has hundreds of ideas for research that I can't obviously talk about today. If you're going to print it, it's like 350 pages. Before you hit your print button, take a look at it. And I've had people say, oh, I'll just print it. Well, it is pretty extensive. Uh, so with that, I'm going to close, turn the program back over to my friend Todd, and we'll go from there.